Welcome everyone to another episode of I'm That Geek Show, the only show in the world that puts you face to face with top thought leaders in real time without the need to travel, with no fees, right there from the comfort of your home, so you too can improve your relationship, your business, your health, um, and everything that you are curious about. My name is Ifat Cohen, I am your host today, and today we are talking about building fanatic communities. Why communities? The world is changing, changing completely from moving from social media to private conversation to more intimate uh, communities that are supporting you, your passion, and who you are around. We are actually shrinking a little bit. And to do that, I have uh, my amazing friend, Warren Carlisle. Hey, Warren, how are you? Hey, what's going on, Ifat? Good to see you. Likewise. So you, you have a really amazing story. Um, and I want to tap on it just a little bit of like how you started um, and how did you become this like expert, community expert that, you know, Facebook invites over and other companies are going like, hey, Warren, can you help us build this awesome thing that you've built? So let's dive a little bit into that and then uh, talk about why communities, what goes into it, how you guys can build it uh, before we do. So, um, tum, ta, 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 let me see, ba, 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 ba. there we go. If you want to join the conversation, hop on in right now. I'm thatgeek.com forward slash live right below the video. There's a button you can hop on in and you too can ask any question that you want about building your own fanatic communities. So let's just start with a little bit of your story and then dive into like why fanatic communities. So for me, uh, I would say that it started back in 2011. I was working in real estate at the time and my mom um, was diagnosed with cancer. I ended up being a pretty aggressive form of cancer and she passed away just three months later after that. And so at the time I was like, you know, what do I want to do with my life? Cause um, I wasn't happy. And I, I guess uh, when somebody that close to you passes away, you start uh, taking stock about your life and, and just kind of what you want to do. And I remember thinking, you know, I don't want to be here in San Antonio anymore. I want to move. And so I remember one day I went to a Barnes and Noble and I was kind of like walking down the book aisles, like really just aimlessly being like, I cannot believe my mom's not here. And I was like, what do I want to do? Um, so I went and I was walking down the fashion um, kind of magazine style. And I was like, you know what? It'd be really cool to move to New York. Um, and so I was like, how could I even do that? I don't know anybody there. Uh, and so what I did was I grabbed a couple fashion magazines, I laid them out in front of me and I was like, I know what I'll do. I was like, I'm going to go on Instagram and I'm going to find a, a celebrity fashion photographer and I'm going to be an intern for a celebrity fashion photographer. And I was like, shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be hard. So I started researching them, um, added them on Instagram. And this was back when, you know, Instagram, the celebrities had a, a ton of followers, but not necessarily the fashion photographers, they, they hadn't really built brands alongside of their talent yet. And so um, they didn't have that many followers. I think, you know, a ton of them just had like 500 or, or so, not like, you know, 100,000 like influencers and all that. And so I reached out and just to make a long story short, I ended up getting an internship um, by, you know, texting a bunch of, of these celebrity fashion photographers and kind of laying out you know, this is some of the things that I could do for you behind the scenes to make sure that you're building your brand alongside of the talent that you're working with. And uh, one of them reached out to me, moved there two weeks later, three months after that, I became a studio manager and immediately started working with major fashion brands like, you know, J. Crew, Todd Snyder, Uniqlo, Mont Blanc, um, and uh, stayed with him for about a year and a half. Uh, and really learned influencer marketing, really uh, witnessed the shift between celebrities being influencers to all of a sudden these people that had what we're going to talk about today, communities uh, being influencers and brands really being curious about working with people that looked like their customer base um, and uh, starting to sponsor their content versus immediately going to celebrities that they were familiar with. Um, so it was a very interesting time. Uh, and then I just kind of got into it. So I started working with some of my friends who were influencers, helping them build their brands um, by telling them basically, this is what brands are doing. So you can do the same thing. They're doing it essentially for free on their social media account. And so I was just reframing and relaying messages and helped a lot of uh, my friends start building brands. 
until I finally decided to build my own brand and become a practitioner and start implementing the strategies that I learned uh, for my community, which is Octonation, uh, the largest octopus fan club. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that's just kind of a little bit of background about me. You know, it's fascinating about this, uh, the speed at which it, which it happened, right? Like yeah. you decide, I'm going to move to New York in two weeks. You kind of like, okay, I'm in New York, right? It wasn't kind of like, okay, five months from now, and I need to have some credibility and I need to have some proof. It was just like yeah. a decision and then it happened. And I think, I think, you know, and I always go back to that. People ask me, uh, how did you just start making decisions? And I was just like, well, you know, when somebody that you love that's so close to you passes away, you realize how um, short of a time we have here on this planet. So why can't things happen faster than normal? You know, if you do build a plan and you say, well, a year from now or two years from now, I want to do this. I mean, apart from you, like wanting to be a doctor and things that like really require, you know, residency and things like that, um, just go after it. Say, how can I do what I would want it to do in six months? How can I condense that to 90 days? Um, and start looking at how creative you can get. And so I was creative in the sense that I just started reaching out and offering these um, celebrity fashion photographers a value in the form of, I already thought out all of the things that you might need me for. Um, this wasn't me just being like, hey, I think it'd be really cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was very practical things that they, I believe that they needed uh, in their you know, business. So, so you know what amazes me about that? And I hear it all the time. People who are just starting out going like, why would I, why would X, Y, Z listen to me? I'm a nobody. I'm just starting out. You know, I don't have anything to show for it. Uh, why would they notice me? They're so big. They're so celebrity and all that stuff that didn't even cross your mind. Right? No. Yeah. And I, I think that's another thing. Uh, all while I was, you know, after my mom passed away, I immediately sought out help, uh, in the form of a therapist, uh, which is another thing that, I mean, if I, if I do one thing for my clients, when we first start working together, it's saying, you know, who's in your corner as far as your mental health is concerned and not from a place of you're broken, you need help, you need whatever, but from a place of high performance. Um, do you have the skill set in your brain to move you forward fast? Because I would, I would say that that was kind of like my, my secret sauce really is the fact that if I had an issue or if I had disempowering language or I said, you know, I don't think, why would they want to do this with me um, and things like that? I mean, that, that's a form of disempowering language. Why not you? You know, if, if you move in that direction of empowerment and not allowing, you know, um, the littleness of like maybe your ego to come through and just be like, hey, who do you think you are? You just did this. Or, you know, you should be, you should be, um, I don't know, uh, like freaked out because your mom just died. And like, you know, all those things that will come and rush to you. I mean, all of that will stop you from moving really fast. And so if you can get somebody in your corner um, that's a third party objective that has your best interest at hand, that's saying, no, uh, let's move forward fast, um, then that would be a, a definite great use to you. So if you're listening and you're wondering why, like maybe you're not moving as fast as you want to, maybe it's, maybe it's not anything that you're not doing, maybe you're doing everything that you can, uh, but you need that third party objective to come in and say, I see what you're doing. Um, and then break you through those barriers. I love that. And you know, that actually leads into communities because a co community can be that thing for you. You know, they can support you. They can have your back. They can go through the journey with you. Um, especially when it is shared passion, right? And shared interest and shared mindset. So let's, let's flip, let's pivot into that because you say that you believe that communities are the life blend, lifeblood of brands. Uh, in the relevancy of today's digital marketplace, especially now in the global pandemic. So can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Like, why do you think it's the lifeblood of businesses right now? Because people, what, what I've seen um, arise since, you know, I started this is I've seen the world online, you know, on Facebook and on social media, just everywhere. <laughs> people want a space where people like them or people that identify as being like them are having conversations because they want to know that if they're receiving information, it's coming from a person that understands their specific, you know, life or their specific circumstances. And so what I see a lot of uh, community leaders do when they first start their community is they, they um, have a tendency to go very broad and mm -hmm. say, okay, so say I want to help, you know, women lose weight. 
um, what happens as a result of doing that is you're going to alienate a, a, a ton of people by being that broad. Because there, there might be, you know, a woman in that community that's like, well, what if I have lupus? Well, you know, what if I just, you know, got finished having a kid? Well, and so what people are, are really looking for is for a community leaders to come forward and say, this is who I'm going to start with. This is the community that I'm going to build specifically for these, this, this type of person and in these circumstances. And, um, and that's how you build a very, a very close connection to a community member. Um, people, you know, when you, when you look at, you know, Facebook or Instagram, or if you look at an algorithm, they want to connect you with, with other people to build meaningful connections. Right. And, um, the algorithm is really looking at, okay, well, how meaningful is it? How specific is this community leader with who they work with? Because if you help the algorithm with being very specific with who you help and what you help them do, then they'll help you as a result of distributing your content to those people. But if there's an uncertainty on your end, then you're definitely not going to be helping the case as far as, you know, uh, distribution is concerned. So and, people yeah, are really wanting that. You, you said something like a very important word. You said meaningful, like the algorithm looks to see whether the conversations are meaningful. How does the algorithm know whether or not you're having a meaningful community? So what they really look at, and, and this isn't really, I mean, they don't come out and say this, but as a result of me, you know, managing communities and posting thousands of times and receiving millions of comments, uh, really what they're looking for is, um, you know, community leaders who are facilitating conversations um, in the, the comment section. So, you know, when you go to a comment section and you just see people saying like, good job, or this is great, or nice post, or they're commenting about something very superficial or you know all that they all they have, that they have the ability really to see um, what facebook and a lot of social media platforms look at is it's called the open thread meaning are you engaging in a conversation in the comment section are other members connecting with others in the comments sec section over shared interests how long are are the posts you know how and, and that's kind of like what they can look at as far as um you know meaningful conversations and connections are concerned is what's going on in that comment section what sort of you know relationships are people forming there and if it is surface level and if it is just uh you look great in that dress or this or that it's very like one-sided then what happens is you know the algorithm pretty much looks for who are they really who do they really care about uh, to the, you know, to the tune of they're commenting in the comment section, they're really opening up, they're connecting with other members. And so that's what you have to facilitate as a community leader on your posts. Yeah. When you're, you have a very specific structure, right? You call it uh, the seven C's. And because we don't have a lot of time to go into all of them, I'm just going to say what they are and I'm going to ask you a question yeah. about that. Is that cool? Okay. For, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So your seven C's starts with clarity, which I think is like, the hardest part of the whole thing clarity the <laughs> hardest part <laughs> the hardest part uh clarity core values content collaboration connection conversion and consistency mm -hmm. so um you know because we don't have a lot of time to go into all of that i didn't notice that you were talking about size right look you didn't talk about followers or how many people are in the community or anything like that which is the one thing that most people who get started with community seems to care more about. Um, yeah. So why don't you care about the number of followers? I don't care about the number of followers because I don't think the number of followers should dictate the quality of your the content or your willingness to want to provide your community with the best programming or the best content that you can possibly create. And the example that I give is when I started Optination and I had 40 followers, one of my first activations or first people that I collaborated with and had email correspondence with was a New York Times bestselling author of the book, Soul of an Octopus, Cy Montgomery. And had I thought, well, I'll talk to her maybe when I have 100,000 or maybe she'll want to work with me. Like all of that is one side. That's me talking to myself. That's what I call focus group of one. That's mm -hmm. not her actually having a say in the decision. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to reach out to her and let her know that this community exists. Let her know what my mission is for this community. And then just just have start off a conversation and just int introduce myself. And um, she immediately said, how can I help? You know, wh what can we do now? You know, can we create something together? And so that kind of gave me more confidence to be like, what am I waiting for? Like if, I, if I'm starting with the best, 
then <laughs> then I, I, need, I need to figure out and I need to start connecting with more people. And since then I've collaborated with hundreds of underwater photographers, um, organizations, um, authors, uh, scientists, um, I never stopped. And so, and it never, the number of followers that I had was never relevant to the quality of content that I created. And so tons of people, when they first start out, they think, okay, well, I guess I'll just start doing this. I'll play really small and I won't give them everything. And, and until I have this, I'm not going to release my best content. You should, as a creator, as a content creator and community leader, start from the best day one, zero followers, best content you've ever created in your life, because you have the ability to go viral. Uh, you have the ability to have that resource shared as an asset to, you know, to, if one person sees it and they think that it's, you know, worthy to share in their timeline, we live in this social media world where if you're creating value and, and you're putting it in front of the right people, it can go crazy fast. There's plenty of people who that's their story um, where they, they created a piece of content and bam, they went viral and all of a sudden they're on the Ellen show or bam, all of a sudden they're on, you know, mainstream television. So why not you in that regard? So let's talk about that for a second, right? Because uh, a lot of the stuff about creating a community, you started with clarity, creativity, um, and it's you're focusing a lot about the audience, right? Yeah. What content they want, what value they want, how to facilitate conversations between them. Um, so let's talk about the mistakes that people make when they first start to create a community. Is it, you know, a lot of people look at uh, um, the tools, right? Where am I yeah. going to do it? What am I going to give it? doesn't seem like this is the most important thing to focus on, is it? No, yeah. I mean, I would go back to clarity only because that's where I start with everybody. And there's been plenty of times where I've unraveled complete brands because there's not enough clarity with, with and I, I say it comes down to two things, who and what. Um, mm -hmm. Who is the community for and what is about. And the more vague or uh, those two um, categories are, the more the harder it is going to be for you to create a deeper meaningful connection with your community so if if i'm um say i want to help bloggers i want to teach bloggers how to monetize their blog right that would be a very broad thing because that could be bloggers from food bloggers to this to that to you know whatever and your community is going to have to reframe the information as it relates to their business so the speed of implementation is going to be longer Mm -hmm. Whereas if you helped, I help females who are in the home decor space monetize their blogs, all of a sudden you can create content specifically for that niche, specifically for those women to, to, to create fast results, to get immediate transformation stories and to, to create a ripple effect within that space. And then once, once you're deserving of attention and you've gotten the, that people, you've, you've hit a home run with that audience, then let's go a little bit more broad and say, well, now that we work in the home decor space, we're going to get a little bit more broad and, and go to a different industry, but not until you have a minimum viable community um, with, within a given space. Um, because then what's going to happen is you're going to have to spend a whole lot of money on ads because mm -hmm. then you start alienating market segments. Whereas like, just make it easy. <laughs> when you're starting in the beginning, really try to nail down who can you provide information to that makes you happy, that you can talk all day, you you feel like you can uh, create fast wins, or you just know that you can hit it out of the park with um, with a certain type of community member. Start with that and then scale up from there. I love that you said, uh, you know, what you love to do. So uh, yeah. we just launched our own Action Hero Communities and the people in there are people that I love spending time with, right? We can let everybody in, but I'm like, who do I really <laughs> enjoy spending my time with? Otherwise, it's going to be like, ugh, like uh, it's a drag, right? Yeah. Um, and so let's say someone decide, okay, I know who I'm serving. I know uh, what am I going to give them, right? Like uh, how am I going to do it? And now the next step would be to decide where they're going to have their community, right? So yeah. whether it's social media or Mighty Networks or their own website, do you have a preferable way uh, that you suggest people start with the community, test it out, and then X, Y, Z? Yeah, I mean, um, as far as when we get to platform, I would say before we get to platform, I mean, I really go in order with the, the seven Cs where I go to core value next mm -hmm. and really figure out what is the, the shared or the collective identity of your community going to be. Because a lot of people think, well, I'll just post content and the right people will find me and just know what I'm all about. 
Um, and so I really say, no, we really need to be intentional with your core values and the values of the community because your content will manifest a certain type of individual. And so if you want to be snarky and that's part of your humor and you, you know, and that's kind of what you want, what you want to do, put that in your value set so that you attract those people and that you always stay within those, that kind of like that, that brand story or whatever. When I get to platforms, um, really what I'm looking at is we do some research on figuring out, you know, is that a platform that they, is that a platform historically that they're on? You know, if it is, you know, say, we'll go back to the example of the females in the home decor space who have existing blogs and they're looking to monetize more, create more revenue streams, then they're most likely on Instagram, um, you know, because that's a very visual, you know, home decor that's in, in Pinterest potentially. So we start, we start looking at that, like, you know, where are these people showing up and where are they creating content? It has nothing really to do with the, the community leader at this point. It has everything to do with the audience. So you, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways, we move the community e leader's ego aside and it's all about figuring out, okay, if this is where the attention span of this ideal community member is, then that's where we are. Um, if, if they're following certain associations, if they're following certain brands, if they're, and those brands have a foothold on a given platform, all of a sudden that's where we are. So um, it's a lot of strategy in the beginning, uh, which is, I think, something that people kind of skip over. They're just like, I, I just want it to happen or it's just going to happen for me because I want it really bad. And it happens for some people that have really raw talent and that are, are making things happen, but we can strategically build it and, and have it happen pretty quickly. And I can tell you some stories later on about other communities I've built. Um, but um, yeah, you need, to, you need to think of that strategy to begin with. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. A lot of people, you know, even when they go, they start live streaming, right? Okay, let yeah. me just pull my phone and start talking to it, but there's no strategy behind it, so it doesn't lead anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I love your clarity and your core values. It's so important to know what you stand for, right? Especially nowadays. Um, yeah. So we decided who we are right? We decided who we help. We found our audience wherever they're engaging on. Um, mm -hmm. Do we spend the first, I don't know, few weeks actually talking to these people, engaging with them before we go like, hey, come over to my house. I'm having a party over there. Like, are we celebrating <laughs> with them first? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I guess from there, I mean, I, I, again, I go back back to the order. Once you know your clarity, once you have your core core values, then we start looking at your content and um, we start developing what I call programming. Um, so, you know, essentially, now that we know who we're trying to reach, what, we're, what our page is about, we know what we stand for, what our core values are, then we start, we start really, you know, we can either join some Facebook groups um, to really figure out um, and answer some questions in there, some preliminary questions. Um, or we can start doing reader interviews where um, you reach out to somebody. And sometimes people think this is so weird, but I mean, if you're really passionate about your, your community, um, it's, I'm an introvert, right? So I understand that when I say, I want you to call someone or have a Zoom meeting with someone and to interview them, uh, it, it can get kind of like, oh, like I don't wanna do that or you know whatever, but if, if you have, like I said, this huge community dream and, and you really believe in, in the, what you're building, um, you'll start doing things like that. So reader interviews, you reach out to someone who's your perfect person, who, who belongs in your community and you have a conversation with them about, you know, where, where are they currently looking for the sort of content that you wanna provide? Um, you, know, you know, who do they admire in that space? Um, and you, you start asking them these questions so you can get a, a really good feel for Where's their attention on a daily basis? Are they following a blog of somebody that you need to work with in the future? Uh, maybe you need to do like a guest post there or you need to reach out and collaborate with that person so that you can be in, in front of more people like that community member. Um, what sort of content are they enjoying from that person um, so that you can be inspired by it or you can um, understand kind of really what they're into and then also what they're not into. Like, you know, what makes them like, like put their phone up. Um, so like I said, a lot of this is, is strategy prior to doing anything, you can get answers for everything that you need to be doing from your ideal, you know, community member. 
um, before you launch. So I would say after that, you know, you have you start developing that content strategy out. Like, what is that going to be? Uh, I know for me, just to give you an example with Octonation, people really loved videos and they loved um, kind of like this, um, these fast facts or mm -hmm. at a glance facts. So not like really in depth, but just at a glance, something that was easily digestible. They said that they really enjoyed those. Um, and so that's more of what I created. Um, so it was almost like I was taking their order in a sense uh, and giving them what they wanted because they were basically telling me, this is the sort of content that I share. This is the sort of content that I comment on. Um, and so what did I do? I created that. <laughs> So, um, so when I first started posting, I started getting five, 10, 20 shares, um, because I did that research beforehand to, to have the foresight to know, um, what they engaged with and what they wanted to see. And I love what you're saying. I love the, the fact that like you go out there first, you engage with people first, you find out what they want first before you go and start getting into this whole content creation thing. Yeah. Um, and I had, to, I had to ask myself too, like when I started Octonation, you know, who out, who's out there currently or who's working with other people that self-identify as being interested in the octopus? Where am I going to find these eyeballs that have, you know, that, like, where's their attention on a daily basis? And so I started just thinking up different places. Well, they're probably going to the aquarium to actually see one in person. Well, they're probably, you know, underwater photographers that take photos of them. Maybe they have communities of people that really look forward to that sort of content. So I'm going to connect with them. So it's, it's almost like figuring out instead of just um, going live to your, you know, your page and just being like, well, hopefully the right people show up. Right. It's, it's being very clear with where do these people, sh where do these people show up actually, you know, and have I actually had conversations with these people or am I just making assumptions based on my very limited um, yeah. like research or knowledge yeah. of this, right? Yeah, it's very interesting, right? Because I, I, this is what I really love about you and I. We both feel like, you know, there's difference between broadcasting at people and actually communicating and having a dialogue and building those relationships. A lot of people, when they start, they're going like, Ugh, but you know, too long. Why is relationship take time, right? I don't have time. So, I just want to get like 10,000 people and get some sponsorships. Doesn't yeah, work I call, like that. I call those vanity <laughs> metrics, right? Yeah. And so you, there's plenty of communities and uh, community leaders that I know that say they have less than 200 members, right? right? But they're very specific. So say I work with uh, a woman named Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, and she helps women who suffer chronic debilitating migraine get more stuff done throughout the day because they're typically, you know, you never know when the migraine's going to hit. She has a group full, I think there's like 800 people in her group, um, but that group is a highly engaged group. Um, mm -hmm. She provides a lot of tools, tips, and resources. It's a very lucrative gr group in the sense where there's a ton of people who want access to people who are chronic migraine sufferers. So she can work with other, you know, organizations or things to, to either, you know, let them come in to speak to her people that she's talking to. So there's just a lot of different things. It's, it's not necessarily, oh, I need a hundred thousand people or, oh, I need, you know, half a million people to be successful. Um, it's just, you know, like I said, being very clear with who you're helping, why. I always say that, you know, I don't need 2 million followers, right? I need like 10 clients. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. And I, I'm sure you know that story of that Instagram influencer with 2.3 million followers who could not sell 32 shirts. Right. Have you heard that one? Yeah, I've heard that one. And I, I mean, I've worked with influencers in New York. I remember when they, you know, I first started doing some consulting work and I was really, I was like really surprised. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this person who has 500,000 followers wants to work with me. And then I'd start looking into their analytics and I was just like, oh wow, like they're a train wreck. Like, um, and then I'd start looking at, um, okay, why aren't they making sales? It doesn't make sense. And then I would go through their content strategy, which was pretty much like little to nothing. And I'd be like, oh, you're trying to sell a product or like a, say it was like a fitness influencer. You're trying to sell how to get a six pack for, for like, say 99 cents for like a PDF download. But historically, you've never once provided instructional videos to your community members. So they're not used to learning from you. They're following you because they, they envy you. They want your lifestyle. Um, they want the girlfriend that you have. They want, they want very superficial things from you. They do not want education. And I was like, so we have to develop a strategy where they, they understand that 
you can help them reach their fitness dreams. So I'd start working with them and saying, okay, let's develop this content out. So people understand that you are a trusted or reliable source for this information. Um, and we started doing that and all of a sudden shit sales shot up because they were like, Oh, I had no idea that you taught this stuff. I just thought you were a thirst trap. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought you were someone to follow to, to just look at and to envy. I'm just like, no, you really have to start developing this, this practical content out. Um, and so that's what I would help certain influencers do. Um, I don't work with so let, let's dive into that influencer and, and we're going to let you guys hop in and actually speak with Warren about your own communities and your own questions in about five minutes. If you want to, this is the link. You're watching us right now. I'm that geek.com forward slash live. Hop on in. We'll have a conversation. But let's talk about influence marketing for a second, right? Because okay. that's kind of like the coveted, you know, the golden goose egg. Everybody wants to be an influencer and just get paid for that. Um, so first of all, what makes an influencer? What makes you an influencer? Um, I believe as far as influence is con concerned, if we just go back to the definition from a business standpoint, an influencer is someone who, uh, helps influences others buying decisions or their buying mm -hmm. habits. Um, so you don't necessarily need to have like a ton of followers to be an influencer. You just need to have some analytics on how effective are you at driving attention to an offer to, to convert somebody mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and I mean, that's, that's pretty much it on that end. If you're, if you're talking about like these mega influencers that have like celebrity power or that, you know, um, people use for spokes model reasons, um, then that's like a different type. But, um, nowadays, and what some influencers think is that companies want them to be an influencer so that the company can make money. But what they don't realize is that, um, a lot of times companies want to work with an individual because they don't want to um, pay what it costs to for all the production. So mm -hmm. if I'm say a brand like J Crew or something like that, um, and I uh, am, am gonna like be shooting my next collection or something like that, I have to p pay a groomer, a production <laughs> assistant. I have to get a location. I have to get all, all the licenses for that location. I have to like it gets into a lot, a lot of money. Whereas if I hire um, a talent that has a really great camera and that has historically shown to be able to tell a really great story, then instead of having to pay all of that money to do that, I can work with this influencer and I can put ad spend behind them and sell to their, their given market segment. I know I'm kind of getting geeky. I'm kind of geeking no, out about cool. that. cool, right? Yeah, because uh, nobody thinks about that stuff, right? We yeah, think like followers work, and vanity yeah. numbers. That was my world. Yeah. So that was my world. That's, I mean, so I saw all the, the money that went into the production of, um, of taking photos of people that nobody even knew about. They were just, they were models. Right. And the reason they were using those models was to typically cater to a given market segment or a demographic. Um, but now what brands are finding is that they can work with people that have, um, a certain number of followers. Um, but th that's not really where they're, they're concerned about making their money. They're concerned with finding those, those people, um, that they can, um, essentially like tap into that market segment. Um, so like lots of influencers, like, well, what if they don't want to work with me because I'm not going to make them any money. I'm like, that's not the only reason why a brand would want to work with you. They'd want to work with you because you're a perfect steward or you're a perfect ambassador for the type of person that they want to attract. So if you're, say you're an elderly woman who uh, sells, sells craft supplies um, on eBay or something like that, um, Scotch tape or something like that might want to work with you, not because they want to make money off of, of your followers, but because they're looking for someone just like you um, to sell tape to um, because there might be other people that, that could potentially use that tape and they want to spotlight you because they're trying to go after your, your, your market demographic. So in that sense, they're not trying to make money off of you and your followers. They're trying to spotlight you and then put ad spend behind you and make money off of your, your demographic. So it's just a completely different way about thinking about being an influencer because most people stop in their tracks and they say to be an influencer is to, to have a million followers. It's like, no, <laughs> you could just be a really pretty person or, 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 or a person. It doesn't even have anything to do with looks, honestly. I don't know why I said that but you could be the type of person that a brand is looking for because they want more buyers like you. 
Right. Which is fantastic. What you're saying is like you're basically creating the content for them. So you're saving yeah. them all the headache of content creation. And instead of them figuring out ads or paying some random person, you're going there, you're putting your, you know, all the production behind it, your thought, your words, your look, everything. And they, yeah. and that's their content. Yeah. And I know, I, you know, we, we have, you know, people have really, really nice cameras nowadays. Uh, and the technology nowadays is, I mean, it's nothing for an influencer or for a brand to, to send an influencer a really, really high-end camera or something like that to, to take their photos with because normally what they would be paying in production costs for a day or two days worth of work, they have so many people on payroll. You know, they have so many people. So if they can cut that team down and go go a little bit leaner, uh, which is what a lot of, what I see a lot of emerging fashion brands do, selling direct to consumer and things like that, um, they can employ influencers that have these built-in audiences and, oh, by the way, use their likeness for advertising. Like so that. it's like a, it's a double win for them. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, let's bring in some uh, some audience questions. So, Amy, let's start with you. Um, hop on in. I'm in. You're in. Hey. hey there. So, Warren, when you are first starting a new campaign, a new project, how do you find the people? How do you engage them? And how do you shift them to your community? So there's a lot of different ways. Um, I would say, like to try to give you an example, um, I'll give you an example with Unhide School. So Unhide School was, um, it's a, a website or a, a community where they unhide the process behind CGI. So you know the people that created Toy Story and, and things like that. Um, well, CGI is super technical. It's, it's really hard to, to really explain everything that goes into it. And so what uh, the founders of Unhide School wanted to do is they wanted to create a school uh, to unhide the process of CGI and they wanted to do a subscription model. So every single month they could um, pay and they could be a part of the subscription group and they could learn this ongoing skill set of being a CGI artist. So their initial strategy was to work with other, uh, and this is something I helped them create together, is working with other CGI artists on live stream, so doing a live together where they would talk about that artist's specific process for how he does work. Because what we made the assumption of is that there are a lot of um, CGI artists that are following specific creators that, um, that when we do the interview together, what's going to happen is that their audience is going to understand that Unhide School is a place where the things that they want to learn how to do is housed, right? And so just by facilitating that, that conversation with that artist and sharing that content on their platform, that artist sharing that content, then what happens as a result of that is people start learning, okay, well, who is this person? Okay, this is Unhide School. Who is this person? Okay, this is my favorite artist who I follow and who I admire. Oh, they're having a, con what are they talking about? Well, what's Unhide School? Unhide School is a place that teaches people how to, well, I want to learn how to do that. It's like, and then all of a sudden they just start coming over to your, to your school because you're facilitating those types of conversations on a daily basis on your platform, right? So I would say that in a lot of ways, when you move past content, you start getting into collaboration um, and you start creating content with other people, you start asking yourself, who is currently catering to people that I want in my audience? Like, how are they pr providing with them with tools, tips, and resources? And could I potentially interview them on my platform or could I create content with them on my platform um, to kind of like start bringing them over? Um, and so that's, that's what, I, what I would do. And the, the cool thing is too, is once you create that conversation, say it's Unhide School creating a conversation with uh, an artist, then you have an asset, right? You have something that you can run Facebook ads to to your perfect audience. You have, you have an asset that you can share into Facebook groups and say, hey, I had a conversation with this really amazing you know, person. I thought you guys would like it because this is what your group is about. You know what I mean? So you can start driving attention based on the things that you're creating, the types of conversations that you're having with other people. Um, and so that's kind of uh, uh, a very strategic way in which you can do that. So um, I, again, it goes back to having you know, conversations with people that are really fired up about, you know, the subject of your page. 
Um, and so having those, creating more, more assets like that. And like I said, just creating, creating the best content. So that's where I would start. Thanks Warren. And I want you to know, um, I did what you suggested about doing the caption this nice. on my page and, uh, I got several comments. And then I went back and commented on it and I'm going to do that again. So that was really, really good. And, and the more dialed in you can get, like, so if it's captioned this, make sure that it has to do with your like community, that it's like, like something that they, um, like say if you ran a crock pot page or something like that, that the caption, this would be something funny as it relates to that space. So that if somebody shares it, you're getting more of the right people. Cause I know on Facebook, you you have the ability to invite people to like your page. And so you want to make sure that if something goes viral, it's going viral because it has something to do with the, the type of page you are, the type of topic the, you know, that you're sharing on that page. So always be conscious of that. Got it. Thanks so much, Warren. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, following up on that same conversation, um, let's talk about the B2B space. Right. So okay. a lot of people are thinking, well, if I'm in the B2B or business people or CEOs, they're not really on social media. Uh, how do I get in front of them? Is it mostly paid ads or is it collaboration or what's the strategy to get in front of the B2B market? And I mean, I think you know this better than anyone because you've done this, you thought like, I mean, you do this all the time. In that space, what I've found is that you have to figure out the, the easiest way. I mean, even like this, just sending someone a Zoom link so that all they have to do is click on it because there's tons of people that I work with that have never been on Facebook Live um, that, that do not do technology whatsoever. And so uh, coming up with a very clear way in which um, they feel comfortable um, and maybe like sending them, you know, um, like just setting your expectations right up front because a lot of them, they say, you know, I've never done live, I don't do live. Uh, and so when, you, when you're first having that conversation and you're connecting with them, you have to create almost like this, the standard operating procedure of this is how easy it's going to be to have a conversation with me or for us to have a conversation together. Maybe initially the, the, like, say you really want to live with somebody who's a CEO of a company or like that. And they're like, no, I don't do that. Then you don't go, okay, well screw that. He's not interested in that. You go, okay, I'm going to write a blog. I'm going to create some sort of content with this individual that I can create, like use as an asset so that in the future I could run traffic or advertising to that and target that person's, that CEO's, you know, potential people or fans of that CEO. Um, so you never want to just be like, well, if they don't want to do the thing that I want to do, then we're not doing, we're not doing it because there's been plenty of times with scientists that I've worked with. And I've worked with a lot of people in the education space that are just not, that do not want to do anything uh, via live where I'm like, cool, send me a photo send me this, you know, I'll write up, I'll take a journalistic approach to this and I'll create something from it. Um, so you definitely want to be thinking about that. It's what, what's ever easiest for them. And typically what I do is I look on whatever platform they seem to be posting a lot on. Um, so if say it's Twitter and they have a, like a following on Twitter, I go back and I see what are they sharing? What historically have, have they posted? Um, could I create something similar, but for my community, because I already know they feel comfortable creating content like that. So everything is perfectly geared towards, um, the person that you're trying to collaborate or work with. And if you don't do that research beforehand and you just go in for an ask, um, then you you might've killed your only opportunity to connect with that person. So you want to come in with a lot of thoughtfulness. And that's how I've been able to connect with tons of people is I know that you do this. I know that you don't do that. I'm willing to do this. We can meet specific times. Like they really appreciate that. Um, so whatever is easiest for them. Do you ever have like, you know, kind of like, uh, I don't know how to call it, like snobby guests, you know, yeah. I'm kind of like, yeah. How do you deal with them? <laughs> um, how do we deal with them? <laughs> So it depends. I have, one, I have one and I have, you know, I have a few who come would, up and I was like, you know, I have a form. I'm like, I need you in order to promote you and everything. I need you to fill this out. And they just ignore the whole thing. Right. Um, okay. So what I would do is I, I would, I would, I'd be clearly communicate. I would say, so if, if this, if, if you're not the best person to send this form to, do you have an assistant? Just mm -hmm. uh, like, do you have somebody that, that normally does this stuff? for you. So not making the assumption that the person that's, that's on the podcast or that you're facilitating conversation with does work like that. Um, 
like uh, may, maybe depending on whatever, I might send them, say, hey, uh, I've done this with a lot of people um, where before their interview, I send them an Octonation t-shirt. Mm. Um, not that I want them to wear that when I'm talking to them. I just want them to be like, wow, this is really nice. No one's ever done that to me before. And I hear that all the time. I either send them a stuffed animal. I send, they talk about, oh, you know, my, my niece, um, some, some um, founder of this, this company that I was trying to get close to mentioned that his niece really likes seals. Hmm. So did I send him a stuffed animal of an octopus? No, I, I sent him a stuffed animal of a seal and an Octonation t-shirt. And I said, hey, and this is for your niece. So it's like, I'm not so warped where I'm just like, no, everybody must love what I love. I'm not going to listen. I'm not gonna, I am like so dialed into what are they saying? You know, and I'm looking for moments in time where I can be like, oh, got it. I got what I'm gonna do. I got my end. Um, and you really have to like be conscious of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it's really interesting. It's, uh, uh, you know, handling guests is not the easiest thing in the world, right? A lot of people go like, well, I'm just gonna get, I don't know, Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins comes with a lot of other stuff, right? Sometimes it's easier to get like a small influencer and actually have uh, meaningful connections and a better conversation than just going for the big stuff. And I would say too, everybody that I've worked with are people that I didn't previously know um, in the sense where I asked my community, um, who do you admire in this space? Are there any um, marine biologists that are working in the field at a specific aquarium that is doing really cool work that mm. I might not know about? And so that's how I discovered a lot of the people that write for me, Chelsea Bennis, the Octo Girl. Uh, she's in Florida, Megan Holst, who studies um, um, octopus in captivity at Aquarium of the Bay. These people, I wasn't, I didn't know they existed until my community let me know. Now I've developed a relationship with them. But you really, if if you're wanting to build a community, you cannot be the one that's the conductor making all the decisions and it's a, a syndicated programming. You know, a community means that you're very conscious of who your community admires, where their attention is on a daily basis. What are they doing to connect deeper with the things that they're telling you that they love? Obviously they're a part of your group for a specific reason, you need to know all those reasons, like why they tune in, why they're not tuning in, you know, right. what would make them tune in more. Um, and those are surveys that you can run and you can do if your engagement starts getting low. But every single time my engagement dips really low in the Octonation community, that just means my finger isn't on the pulse. I don't get it anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm not connecting with my community anymore. Um, and so I, I send out again another survey and I say, hey, for those of you who fill out this survey, I'm giving away X, Y, Z. I create incentivized attention uh, and I get the responses back and I start looking at it and I go, oh, this is why they're not tuned in because mm -hmm. they're, they're watching this person on, you know, over here. I need to connect with that person. So you have to get that feedback. And if, and if you just think you know, because you've been doing this your whole life and you're an expert and you've connected, I've collaborated with hundreds of people. I know my community more than everyone. No, you don't know. Every single day is a new day. <laughs> That's true. So, and you know you what? Know. We're talking communities, not fan clubs, right? So yeah, yeah definitely reach out to the community. Um, speaking of which, Z, how many and she has tons of questions. Hi. Do I? Hey, Hi, yes, Lauren. Hey. <laughs> hey, I have a couple of questions. One of the questions is in regards to clarity um, in my message, I wanted to run a statement by you. Okay. And that statement is, um, I help women that are empty nesters master the art of self-care. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? So women who are empty, uh, so the who is women who are empty nesters and the what is master self-care, right? Correct. So I would say that if you look, you have to start looking at the, okay, so let's start with the who, women who are empty nesters. So. Um, do you have a specific, and typically what I do to narrow this down is I go into your, um, specific story, like your life story. And I mean, obviously we can't, we don't have enough time to do that. No. What we'll typically find is that there are, so that you don't alienate every single woman who's an empty nester, because they're going to believe their situation and their circumstances, um, are different than uh, many other people's circumstances because of what okay. happened in their life. So the clearer that you can get on the woman who's an empty nester, what industry is she in? Is she in the tech industry? Is she, is, is she married? Um, is she um, widowed? Is she like, if you can really narrow like that down to, um, so that when you go to post every single time you post, 
what you're saying applies to a good percentage of the community, 100% of them, then that's when you start being able to, to build something really fun. But if, um, I know, yeah, it's just, it's just right. So write those two down and those two columns, right? Women who are empty nesters. And then other thing is mastering self-care and still try to narrow it down from there to where I'm, I would be very clear with like who you were talking about. So like, you know, with Lindsay Weitzel helping women who suffer chronic debilitating migraine, mm -hmm. uh, it is a very specific, you know, type of person. We could get more specific with what specific type of migraine, but we figured out that that was that was that was getting too too niche. So I, I would still say there still needs to be work done work around that women who are an empty nester. What is her specific situation? She's dedicated her life to um, taking care of others, but she haven't mastered the art of taking care of herself. Yeah. So now, it's the it's the empty nester with the martyr syndrome. Yeah. And, and that's, again, that's like describing those, those are, um, like I said, I want to know specific things like at what age is she now when she's going into um, being an empty nester? What, okay. she, did she have a job? Um, does she, is she currently still working? Um, okay. There's a lot of circumstances that she's in. And typically what, what works best is if you sort of utilize your story, because people are going to be looking to you as that community leader, to, to being like, okay, well, how does this person know or how willing am I to accept this person's advice based on what they went through? They're kind of looking to you as the expert or the facilitator, mm -hmm. the community leader. Like, well, what are your unique circumstances that allow you to, to be facilitating this type of conversation? And um, so I would say the more narrow you can get with that, like what circumstances you found yourself in and then mm -hmm. start working from there. Um, okay. and we can connect if you if you join. I have a group called Community Growth and Profits. I'll have her put it maybe in the comment section or, or somewhere. Uh, we can continue this conversation, but it requires a little bit more more back and forth dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. than just, you know, a hot seat essentially. Like okay. Well, then my my second question is um, in regards. What are your thoughts about Pinterest and using Pinterest um, as a tool to drive traffic? To your website in um, hopes of you know conversion um so with pinterest it just like it, it depends on um i kind of like assess somebody's platform i feel like that conversation is premature in the sense where i go back to clarity so people always want to jump ahead and they want to talk about platforms and things like that but since we just left, left clarity and we still need mm -hmm. clarity there then don't over overwhelm yourself with choosing a platform now. Don't like don't move forward um, without having that fierce clarity with what who am I connecting with? What am I doing? Because it might not be Pinterest might not be the best place. It might be a Facebook group mm -hmm. because this this woman does not want to facilitate conversation about being an empty nester in a public forum. You know, what right. I mean? so it really goes back to what is your community comfortable? You know. Like and and not making the assumption that they're comfortable, but after having real conversations with you know that perfect person, that that woman who self-identifies as like being who who like you think she is, um, mm -hmm. saying you know what sort of environment would you feel comfortable posting in? And, it, and if it's if all of them say Pinterest, uh, then you're like okay, Pinterest it is. But I'm I'm making the assumption that it's going to be a Facebook group for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that good? You got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, I did. We'll connect, when we'll connect more in community growth and profits. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so tell people where to find you, uh, Warren. Yeah, so I have a Facebook group. Um, it's, it's pretty brand new. Um, I'm running it with my partner. It's called Community Growth and Profits with Roberto and Warren. And I handle all things growth. Um, so making sure that there's clarity, like I said, there's attention in, in the group, the engagement is high that you're doing collaborations with the right people, that the contents, the contents there, basically all of my seven C's of building a fanatical community. And Roberto uh, hones in on profits, revenue streams. Um, are you creating tools, tips, resources? Are you monetizing those tools, tips, resources? You know, are you, um, are there streams of revenue that you're not cashing in on? Um, and so he has that conversation in the group. Um, and so we're, we've kind of met in the middle and he's, I'm all things growth. He's all things profits. And it's a wonderful, 
it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful marriage. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so let's finish with this, right? Um, we're looking online. A lot of people are still in the vanity number, you know, game. Uh, hopefully that will die soon. Um, yeah. We are in the vanity number game and in the influencers game, which is a lot about vanity numbers. And yeah. you and I are all going like, no, 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 right? Let's build a community rather than focusing on vanity numbers. So mm -hmm. when when someone is just starting out, they're looking at you know the landscape, they're looking at everything that's happening right there, and they're going like, I want to be Gary Vaynerchuk, right? And they forget that Gary Vaynerchuk spent five years just talking to people, right? Before he became like Gary Vaynerchuk, but if they're starting like that and they're going like, okay, this is my, my business model. I want to be, I want to be famous, rich and famous, fame and fortune, right? Everybody to sponsor me and all that stuff. Uh, and we're telling them, no, instead of following the vanity numbers, let's focus on building the community and the relationships for you. It happened very quickly, right? In a matter of like a few weeks to a month to kind of like figuring out what you want and going for it. What, what should people who are just starting out right now, kind of like expect, what are like the right expectations of, uh, I'm starting a community and it's going to happen in a year, in six months, within a month, like what are, what are the kind of like the milestones that they should be looking at to know that they're on the right path to build like a solid community? I, I mean, I think when you mentioned Gary, um, most people aren't aware that his, like, if you look at the, a clear, clearly defined who and what it was a specific, you know, wine store that he worked in with his father that was in a specific location and he created marketing you know uh and in a buzz around that specific thing um they see him oh it's like this like what what appears now and a lot of people have that story a lot of influencers have that story jasmine star she you know she comes across this this you know huge influencer now but she started as a wedding photographer you know, and then built up and helped other wedding photographers book more, you know, gigs and things like that. And then she went up and went up and up. Um, I think people are really attracted to, oh, I'm going to um, start off and be this very broad thing. Like, I'm going to start off and be Nike. I'm going to start off and be McDonald's. Um, but they're not realizing there was a founding store in a specific location and, and things like that. But what is going to be your founding, what I call it, it's your minimum viable community. But in that community, and it doesn't, I don't care if you have to start over because communities can grow fast once there's clarity in them. Like I've, I've taken communities, like I, 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 one of my friends who graduated from college, she wanted to um, teach um, uh, kids how to make slime. And um, so we decided that she wanted to work with eight to 13 year old girls, helping them uh, create, like make slime. We started looking into who currently caters to those people. What are they currently interested in? We started making thematic slimes that that eight to 13 year old girl would be interested in. And she went from zero to like over a hundred thousand followers within like six months. Wow. So but it was because there was that clearly defined audience and we had, we had, we thought of all those conversations. So I would say it just goes back to that fierce clarity. And I mean, that's where I take everybody when I first start talking to them is where they think they're, they're clear, they're clear to themselves, but they don't have marketplace clarity, meaning that if I called up somebody in their community and I'd say, hey, what is so-and-so about? Um, and then I called another person and said, hey, what do you think so-and-so is about? If all of their messaging is different, then that means as a community leader, you have not given them the words that they need to accurately talk about your community or what the value of your community is. So if I said, what is Octonation? And the next words out of somebody's mouth wasn't, it's the largest octopus fan club, then I have to take responsibility for that because that's my job to clearly communicate that to the market, right? So Octonation didn't exist before it was the largest octopus fan club. So I had to, like I said, clearly articulate who, what is Octonation? It's the largest octopus fan club. Who's it for? Octopus fans, people that identify as being interested in the octopus or people that are just now discovering it, right? So that's a very clearly defined um, community and that's why there's success there. Um, when I look at other communities, you know, um, like with Dr. Lindsay Whitesell helping women suffer chronic debilitating migraine. You have Dr. Dre who helps doctors monetize their PhDs by creating mm -hmm. online brands. You have Kyle Schultz who helps, you know, parents take better photos of their children. You know, there's all this, there's fierce clarity within those statements. And so I feel comfortable referring their communities to the perfect person that they, that they you know, want to be reaching. But if there's like, all of these complex words 
that people want to use to describe the type of community, it gets, it gets more and more cloudy. It gets more and more subjective. It gets more and more, I don't know who's the best fit. Good luck with your community. It needs to be, it, it just needs to be easy. And it, every single time you talk about your community, um, you, somebody needs to say, oh, I know somebody who needs to be in that community. Or I, my, my um, niece is a marine biologist. They're, they need to start you know, making connections. And if you're not getting that from anybody around you, um, it's because there's, there's not clarity. And if there's, there's words like the word martyr is a very, it's a psychological term and it's subjective in the sense where it could mean, it could mean a lot of different things. So if you get into complex terminology, you don't have the, con like you can't give somebody in an online environment, the context in which to, um, to make sense of that word and then also follow your page, right? So it's yeah. like, there's a lot of education that goes into those terms. So what are very clearly defined, you know, um, uh, statements that you can create that immediately make people go, I get it. Like, yeah. I'm clear. Yeah, um, so, you know, like I said, I'm always, I'm always working through clarity with, with people on typically our first calls. I'm like, I'm not clear yet, or I don't get it. And I'm in the middle of seven kids. So like, I'm always used to like, um, like talking from my younger brother to my older brother and from my older brother to my younger brother or whatever. And I had to be that person in the middle. And yeah. so I'm like, if I'm not clear with your brand, uh, your market's not clear. Um, uh, cause it's very confusing. <laughs> clarity, clarity is magic, right? Once you have clarity, like everything kind of like falls into place and it's the hardest thing to get because you know, it's hard to see the box when you're in it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's fantastic. Let's, let's finish with this. Influencers seems to be, and celebrities, so out of touch, right? Like, so kind of like, oh, I'm a celebrity. I don't have time for everybody else because I'm so famous and busy and stuff. Yeah. They're right? just not relevant. Yeah, they're, they're falling. They're, they're, they're not relevant because they don't, ha they don't have as many touch points with their um, end user. Meaning, like, people on t like kids on TikTok nowadays, they see their fan base every single day. They connect with their members on a reoccurring basis, we feel like we know them, which means they're more relevant to us, which means they're just like us, which means like, we're going to, we're going to trust them versus we're going to trust somebody who we might see once every year in a movie. You know what I mean? So it's just yeah. that level of connection that we feel like we have, even though it's actually not there, uh, we, we, we feel like we do. So. Which is important because, right. Cause like, um, a lot of people go like, well, if I'm always available, people think that I'm not busy enough or I'm not valuable enough or I'm not, you know, I can't charge enough because I'm always there for you. What's that fine line between like availability and connection? I would say it's um, checking in with the people that are, are following you. It's very easy to book out guests, say for like two or three months. Mm -hmm. And then what you're, because you're making the assumption that, okay, well, I know what this community needs, or I want to steer this community in this specific direction, uh, because of, of like my own, like my own wants or desires or needs, or what I think would be is cool. And what I've found is that there's, there can very quickly grow a disconnect between what your community actually wants versus what you're supplying them with. Like maybe you're supplying them and not, not you, but maybe you're supplying with them with people that are speaking over their heads all the time. And they're, they're like, they're, they're, they, they move because they make the assumption that if you don't understand that they're lost, then maybe that this isn't the community for you. Or maybe, maybe like they need to go to another community where another community leader like really speaks to them from a, an elementary level or a beginner level. You know what I mean? So it's just, um, like I said, checking in the fine line is constantly facilitating a two-way dialogue. And then even having after like our conversation today saying, you know, what did you really think about Warren? What are, what are some things that, you know, that confused you? Or what, what are some things that you want me to go into more detail about that you didn't understand that he was talking about? Like making sure that you're picking up for the pieces that maybe like I dropped to the ball that I dropped. Yeah. Uh, because it's it, at the end of the day, it's your community that like you have to answer to and say, oh, did I mess up? Do you not want more guests like him? Um, you know, who, who do you admire currently? You know, who do you follow that really makes you feel good after listening to them because they don't overwhelm you? You know, just making sure that you're facilitating that conversation, ne never making the assumption that, oh, that was really good. It's like, well, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe they didn't get it. Save a ball. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you so much. We're a little bit uh, uh, beyond the time, off the time, over time. Um, 
tell people again where they can find you and where they can engage with you. So if you're interested in Octonation, um, I mean, you noticed that I didn't really talk about it this whole entire time. Um, you can find Octonation at octopusfanclub.com. That's a Facebook group that you can join if you're interested in the ocean and um, octopus. Um, so you can kind of get an example of, of what I do in there, the content, the sort of conversations I facilitate. Um, and then if you're interested as a community leader, and, um, and even if you right now you're like, oh, I don't identify as a community leader, if you have the intention of becoming a community leader, and that's the title that you want to claim, uh, we have Community Growth and Profits uh, with Warren and Roberto. And that's a Facebook group that you can join and uh, find me in there and, uh, and get some clarity around your community. Yeah, so I'm going to join. All of you should join us. Warren, thank you so much. You are always, always, always above and beyond everything that, um, that you know, that I asked for. So thank you for showing up again. For um, sure. And next week, in two weeks, we are going to have um, the head of creativity and design at Disney as our guest. If you're interested in hopping in and having a conversation, I'm thatgeek.com forward slash RSVP this time. RSVP, and you're going to come in and have a conversation with him. Warren, thank you so much again, and we guys will see you in two